Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Holotube. We are very happy to have uh, Jörg Schmalian with us from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And um, Jörg is telling us about superconductivity without quasi-particles. As you can read from the slide, the screen is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, and uh, the presentation or the results that I will be presenting today, let me just clean up my um, desk here a little bit, uh, is work that was done together with um, initially Ilya Estalis. This is not really the holographic part of the work, um, but it was the discussion of a model discussed here in this paper that led us to um, the calculation, uh, the heart of the calculation was done uh, uh, jointly with Konrad Skalm, which whom some of you uh, I'm sure know, and also with Jan Andre Inkov, who I've just seen in the audience. Uh, Jan just finished his PhD in Karlsruhe and uh, is uh, the key author of this uh, paper here that I will be, be presenting. And then there are follow-up works um, where Veronica and uh, Davide uh, were involved. Um, so, uh, what um, uh, motivated us um, uh, is a problem that has bothered me for quite some time. I'm a condensed matter theorist and I try to understand specific materials. And here we see a number of materials. I deliberately don't even wanna talk about the cuprates because they are, have so many additional complications, but these are materials, so-called heavy fermion systems, cerium palladium to silicon to serum indium three. They undergo a magnetic transition and uh, by, for example, pressurizing the material, you suppress the magnetic order. And at the foot uh, of the disappearance of this ordered state at the quantum critical point, you get superconductivity. And just like in serum indium three, then you look at very, very different materials. This is an organic charge transfer salt, uh, TMTSF uh, that uh, stands by itself for a horribly long name. These are basically molecular crystals that form either layered or uh, chain-like structures that are weakly coupled, form magnetic ordered, magnetically ordered states, density wave states. You have a magnetic order temperature that vanishes. And as it vanishes, you find superconductivity. And finally, uh, a class of material that has um, attracted a lot of attention during the last decade, so-called iron-based superconductors. Once again, you suppress a magnetic ordering temperature and lo and behold, where the magnetic ordering disappears, you find superconductivity. So, and it's a fair question to ask, why is it actually happening? Why is the uh, transition temperature largest uh, right where the, um, uh, super, where the uh, critical point, where the magnetic fluctuations at lowest temperatures should be most pronounced? And uh, the question becomes even, say, more pressing if you want, so if you try to build a tiny little toy model for uh, say a quantum critical state that might be re the result of these magnetic fluctuations that are inevitably there when you suppress magnetic order. And one toy model you could be that you have a, say a system that has a local self energy that is governed by some funny power law, gamma being larger than one. Uh, so more singular than a family liquid, which is what you would expect for gamma really equal one. And if I now make the additional assumption that um, the pairing interaction of the system continues to be instantaneous, um, and I sum up the same diagrams without asking for permission um, that I do in the BCS problem, I get a pairing susceptibility that signals and superconducting instability and I find uh, and this was worked out here in a number of papers in the mid and late 90s, uh, I find that uh, one needs a threshold uh, pairing interaction in order to become superconducting. That's um, quite unsurprising because uh, these are not particularly well-defined quasi particles as you have these branch cut singularities here. Uh, so uh, all singularities are smeared out and weakened. Hence, uh, you would expect that now you don't have a Cooper instability uh, and, um, but you need a threshold in direction. Uh, and that's of course, at least it would imply that just like ferromagnetism, something that we do find in nature quite abundantly, uh, but uh, still um, uh, not uh, as frequently as superconductivity, 
uh, just like ferromagnetism, you need a threshold interaction. And uh, so, so therefore, uh, it, it is not quite clear why um, at the point where you need a threshold interaction, you have the largest TC. Um, uh, so this was ultimately motivating us. And, but of course, this question here has been answered to some degree in the uh, community. And there are two answers that uh, I know of that um, are worthwhile mentioning here. There are other approaches, um, uh, like variational wave functions or physics of one dimensional systems. But the one that I want to mention uh, is superconductivity by critical bosons. And as we will see, holographic superconductivity. Um, superconductivity by critical bosons, the logic is, is that if you happen to have such a critical fermion, say from some Yukawa coupling, your fermions, uh, they couple to some bosons via some uh, Yukawa interactions. This could be a phonon in the conventional superconductor. It could be, say, a spin one boson that mimics the collective excitation of a magnetic system. In all these cases, uh, you have, with more or less justification, uh, local self energies that have such power law behavior, but you also find always something else. What you find is that the pairing interaction is no longer instantaneous, um, but uh, the same, the, 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 the interaction that drives the system to be critical also change, of course, the nature of the pairing interaction. And it by itself, it inherits its dynamics from the fermionic system and is actually governed by the very much the same exponent. Uh, and now you have to actually have a new negotiation between these two degrees of freedom and uh, you have a chance. And in fact, you will see that there's something like a generalized Cooper instability. The more singular pair interaction, at least to some degree, offsets the uh, more weakly, uh, uh, or more the ill-defined quasi-particles in the system. The logarithmic version, the marginal version of this problem was, I think, the one that was studied first here in a paper by Damson on um, color superconductivity mediated by massless uh, gluons. Uh, the first version that goes with a power law goes back to a paper of my good friends, Artyom Abanov, Andrei Chubukov, and Sasha Pinkelstein. And um, uh, those uh, basically initiated a number of follow-up works uh, that all have looked into how we can generate superconductivity in non-family liquids. And then there is something else that happened in the community, something that many of you are, I would suspect, much better acquainted with than I am, namely the, the concept of holographic superconductivity, where you have a meta field uh, on top of an ADS um, a background uh, that you described as an appropriate gravity theory. You have some gauge degrees of freedom because you have charged objects uh, and you're asking for the instability of the system. And with the philosophy that in this context, I really don't need to describe to you guys uh, that uh, such a gravity description describes scale invariant, AKA critical phenomena. You at least have a tool by which you can ask the question, how would I even in principle describe pairing in a uh, critical system. Um, and these are, I mean, and, and clearly, I mean, my home uh, is, uh, you know, approach number one and approach number two was to me very, very mystical. And um, uh, one of the goals of the presentation I'm giving today is to elucidate to some extent, at least to me, uh, what is behind holographic superconductivity. Uh, what we will find is that these are very much the same uh, phenomena and that there is a way to translate one directly to the other in an explicit and, 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 uh, and a straightforward way. Um, so to put this into context, uh, maybe there's a historical uh, comparison one can make, um, if, uh, which uh, is the derivation of the Ginzburg-Landau theory from the microscopic BCS theory. Um, and why do I mention this? I mean, first of all, uh, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Lev Petrovich Gorkov, who did this as a young man in 1959 and showed that the scalar field of the Ginzburg Landau theory um, can be derived from the BCS theory and can be given an identity uh, and expressed in terms of an anomalous Green's function. Um, but there's more that came out of this calculation. For example, something that was unclear. Uh, to Ginzburg and Landau, namely, that what is the effective charge of this scalar field? And 
clearly it comes out um, from a pairing theory that uh, you have an effective charge of 2E. There's even a comment in Ginsburg and Landau's paper that they um, call it E star, don't even know whether it is or not equal to E, but see no reason for it to be different. And the argumentation was, well, if it was different, um, just like a mass or an effective mass that appears frequently in the solid state context, then this mass is usually also space dependent in inhomogeneous regimes. And clearly space dependent charges would be inconsistent with the gauge principle. And of course, the say, topological quote unquote aspect of having an integer multiple of E is not something that at this time they felt um, could be considered. It was a result of this analysis um, and anyway, once again, the reason why I'm mentioning it is the, um, when I talk to um, people who are well acquainted with holography, they find what we derived utterly unsurprising for good reasons, because it had to be like this. But sometimes it is still either for your psyche or for concrete, um, uh, say, materials questions, such as what's the effective charge, not irrelevant to have an explicit map. So to remind ourselves, the anomalous prop propagator that enters here is nothing else but uh, in the singlet channel that, I'm, that we will be looking at is nothing else but the non-local in space and time, uh, say Euclidean uh, uh, propagator, anomalous because it's uh, two annihilation or, or creation operators. And it makes sense to think in terms of center of gravity coordinates, center of gravity time, and their relative coordinates. Um, and uh, if you do so, then uh, all inhomogeneities, say a vortex state, um, uh, or uh, will be then governed by this center of gravity coordinate dependence, uh, all non-equilibrium dynamics of the pair as a whole will be governed by the center of gravity time. The internal space-time structure of the pair uh, will be governed by the relative, by the Fourier transform, what that shows here of the relative coordinates or the relative time degrees of freedom. So uh, this will play a little role as we go on, as uh, you might expect. So what we will be doing therefore is that we start from a specific well-defined microscopic Hamiltonian, albeit a simple one, um, some SYK version, uh, SYK model uh, version. And then we will derive a scalar field that is uh, acting like a holographic field in an entire digital space. Um, and again, it allows us uh, what was most important for me personally, at least, what is the physical interpretation of the additional holographic variable for the good old fashioned condensed matter physicist. And, and of course, can I say something about not just the mere existence of the um, corresponding field theory of a scalar field in gravitational background, but also explicitly calculate the numbers. What is the mass? What is uh, the charge and so forth? Or what are higher order coefficients? This will be our program. Um, the model will be a, um, a version of the such the VK type model. Hence, I will briefly remind us um, uh, of uh, this model mostly to set the notation and, uh, and get all on the same page. So here I'm using the complex version of the SYK model ultimately I want to make a superconductor and uh, it makes sense therefore, I mean, we have to uh, uh, have some concept of charge conservation. Therefore, I don't use Majorana fermions. We have a non-dispersive uh, single particle problem. We have an all to all interaction on the, um, on the interaction level, on the many body interaction level, we have random interactions um, and we approach the problem by using the tricks that were, I believe, initially developed in the context of uh, quantum spin glasses by having say two time uh, or bilocal fields uh, that you can cleverly formulate always as on the saddle point being propagators and self energies if you wish so. If you solve the problem, you get large n self consistent equation and you get among others, for example, these wonderful power laws, uh, branch cut uh, behavior, just like what we want uh, for um, uh, for non fermi liquid state. So when I saw these pictures, at some point, somebody gave a talk in Karlsruhe about the SYK model, and you look at such a picture, then my question was mostly, I want to know what happens to this beast as it becomes superconducting. And this is ultimately what motivated uh, some of our discussions here. And just to, <clears throat> and just to, to, to uh, put this into the context of holography, um, 
a, a slide that uh, is not really necessary for this audience, I suspect, uh, but uh, we all know that this time variables that enters the solution upon Fourier transformation can be reparameterized re uh, in a quite generic way. And um, uh, the infrared behavior is uh, unaffected by it. And uh, there's a nonlinear sigma model that is basically telling us how the UV weights different reparameterizations uh, governed by the Schwarzen. And lo and behold, this is um, a theory that uh, is also the effective description for the uh, proper time of uh, particles in enter the digital space plus appropriate dilaton fields. Good. So that's the SYK model. And it's not the model that we will be studying. The model that we want to discuss is the uh, one that I'm giving you here because we had to formulate it in a way that it gives us superconductivity. So the first thing I'm doing is. Uh, is that I'm just adding a different flavor index, I call it sigma, um, that stands for spin. Uh, I need this because I want to form pairs and I have to deal with the Cooper and with the Pauli principle and I therefore I need another flavor index I want to build, for example, singlets out of this additional index, right? Uh, so there has to be some Kramer's index in the problem um, that uh, I allows me to form singlets and triplets on to form pairs. Uh, they are non-dispersive. In addition to fermions, I'm adding, um, if you want to, so Einstein phonons or bosons, uh, scalar bosons. Uh, they are massive. Um, they have a finite frequency, um, and uh, we need to deal with this frequency as we move on. And the interaction of the problem is you cover coupling between the uh, fermions of same spin and the scalar boson with a random coupling constant G i j k. Uh, so there were some uh, related models. Uh, Yushan Wang from Florida um, had essentially the same model, but uh, with different coupling constants, so they wouldn't become superconducting, but the normal state solutions are the same. And further elaborations on this model or on versions of it uh, were done here by Laura Klaassen and Andrzej Dubokov. And something that will be important for what we want to discuss as we move on is that these models actually can be extended to finite dimensions. That's important for applications in the condensed matter context, but also allows to give a little bit additional insights into the connection between condensed matter physics and holography. As we will see, uh, the upshot of all of this, what we see in high dimension is, is quite interesting. Basically, what you guys have been saying seems to be correct. Um, but before we go there, um, we have a random coupling constant here. And it is allowed, if I add the emission conjugate appropriately, to be a complex quantity. And uh, the distribution function is something that we can design uh, or choose at our, at our pleasure. Uh, for example, if I take G i j for given k to be drawn from a um, Gaussian unitary ensemble, uh, so this is just arbitrary complex numbers, um, uh, then I will find no superconductivity. Um, and uh, the reason is uh, physically that uh, for any given realization in the Gaussian unitary ensemble, I'm breaking time reversal symmetry. Um, and Cooper pairs just are not very happy with broken time reversal symmetry. They like to form pairs of time reverse partners. Um, on the other hand, if I choose this coupling constant to be a real number, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, um, we do find very, very naturally superconductivity. And uh, so in order to be able to interpolate between these two limits, we chose distribution functions but in one limit give us one result and the other limit give us another result. And then we can interpolate between these two because after all, we would expect that to be a critical value for alpha where superconductivity disappears at a critical point. Um, so this is the model now. Uh, we have these uh, random interactions um, and the model can now be treated in the usual ways. Um, I can uh, be qualitative here because we have, uh, uh, we do replica tricks, we assume replica symmetry, uh, we introduce uh, bilocal fields and depending on, uh, as soon as alpha is not equals one, we are forced to have uh, not just uh, the normal propagators that we had in the SYK model early on, but also anomalous propagators that at the saddle point essentially are indicating pairing of that, you know, 
funny zero dimension a problem. And clearly also, we need to do the same game for our bosonic variables. Uh, so there's an abundance of integration variables. Um, uh, we get an action that is, uh, has a, a nice large n limit and at n infinity, we get uh, a problem that can, again, just like in the SYK model for those who are familiar with this, can be given a uh, diagrammatic interpretation. Uh, so what you find at the n infinity level is that um, you get that equation that were written down by Gerasim Eliasberg uh, many, many years ago, I believe in the early 60s, uh, to be exact. So he, uh, these are self-consistent equation. You have a Dyson equation that it takes a matrix character because of the onset of superconductivity with the normalist propagators and self energy is giving us such expectation values uh, uh, to be potentially finite. We have uh, kind of one loopish looking self energy that of uh, generic and the area of self energy for the uh, bosonic problem. Um, and uh, so bottom line is we have an exact um, in the n infinity limit uh, formulation of Eliasberg theory. Um, the solution of this problem, if we first of all ignore superconductivity, or if we choose a distribution function that doesn't have superconductivity, is very, very similar to the usual SYK model, but there's a little bit of a technical difference. I don't think it's an overall fundamental difference. If you look at this, there are two energetic scales, even if I set the chemical potential to be zero. So I'm at neutrality. There's a there's the mass of the boson and the coupling constant. So both can be translated into energy scales, more precisely, of course, the mean value of, of, the, inter, of the coupling constant. And therefore I can build a dimensionless constant, a coupling constant, which is uh, given here, the mean value divided by uh, some power of the frequency. Uh, and um, so you can tune this, uh, but regardless of what you tune there, um, you always find um, the same a critical ground state um, that uh, is very, very similar to what we've seen in the SYK model. All what is different is the temperature regime when this ceases to be the correct uh, result. So what we find are power loss solution, branch cut solutions and frequency space for the fermionic and the bosonic Green's function and uh, that both of these uh, functions are governed by one and the same exponent, um, which is the fractional Landau damping of the uh, bosons caused by the critical fermions and therefore they inherit that dynamics. So if you want to look at it, we have these branch cut fermions, we have bosons that are singular. Uh, if you look at the real axis, the retarded function at finer temperatures that's being cut off. Um, and then you can ask, so how could this possibly be? Our bosons were massive, our phonons were massive, but um, the system uh, loves this critical state uh, so dearly that it basically uh, always renormalizes the bare mass that was massive, no matter what you do to the system, always to a value that at t equals zero, the mass vanishes, and it is a power law behavior of the boson mass governed by the exact same exponent as, for example, a, the frequency dependence would be if I were to Fourier transform this, uh, this object. So this would go like one over the frequency to the power gamma. Uh, just like uh, this mass term would suggest. So, so what you see is the system, um, I mean, I believe this has to happen because um, suppose it wasn't a critical state, it is non-dispersive, it would have a singular compressibility and the system would just not be healthy. So the most natural state for these uh, models is indeed uh, to have a critical scale invariant uh, state, uh, which is what we see here. Good, so we understand the normal state. We should look at this, this is a picture from Jan. Uh, at high temperatures, maybe the individual particles have some existence uh, or right of, of, of existence, but at lowest temperature, that's just a soup governed by the exact same exponents. We then ask the question, uh, what happens to superconductivity? And uh, this is if the, the crossover diagram I sketched to you earlier. And if we then allow for superconductivity here in the red curve, this would be when we have the Gauss North orthogonal ensemble, we find superconductivity to onset with a power law and level off at some finite value to a constant value or of one tenth of the bare boson frequency. So important is we get superconductivity. And if we now tune our um, 
pair breaking parameter, we even can so suppress pairing depending on which part of the phase diagram we are. There's a slightly different regime of suppression, but in all cases, at actually the same value of this critical value of this pair breaking strength, we find that these transition temperature vanishes um, in a fashion that uh, is um, uh, this essential singularity and not what we often find, of course, in other problems like a power law. And uh, clearly, um, this is something that I was to some extent aware of to be happening, for example, in holographic models of enter digital space two. And it is, um, I should have put the reference here of this uh, wonderful paper uh, on conformality lost, uh, the natural way what happens when you break spontaneously conformal symmetry or if you break conformal symmetry, period. So, so that's what we find for the superconductor. We have therefore a microscopic model that gives a superconductivity in a critical state rather naturally. Um, I could now go about and discuss all the details of that superconductor. My suspicion is that is maybe not the primary interest here. There are very, very interesting uh, phenomena happening that in to some extent even comply with the phenomenology that one finds in uh, the cuprate superconductors. But uh, if you want to go further, it might make sense to go to discuss a little bit the nature of the instability and how it comes to this essential singularity and so forth in our language. Now, to that extent, we take these coupled equations um, that we have, um, Elerschberg equations, these are just coupled integral equation, and we solve them right at this point or in the vicinity of that point. Uh, because what I can do here is I can linearize when I'm near these superconducting transition temperatures. Let's say I take this superconducting transition temperature near this transition, I can linearize the pairing problem. Um, and um, if I do this at low temperatures, um, the algebra gets a little bit easier and I don't need to deal with the frequency, discrete frequencies. I just have integrals. This is, uh, well, it's just easier to, to, to deal with. So what I, the linearized equation that we then get is this wonderfully and simple integral equation for the anomalous self energy, a quantity that is an essential quantity in say Elerschberg the physics of superconductivity, it's the self energy of the anomalous propagator. So here we see what we discussed earlier. If this exponent gamma here is zero, this uh, interaction, that's the interaction here, this retarded uh, part here, the pairing interaction gets uh, structureless and, and we have uh, one over the um, running frequency behavior, so this gives us a log. This is the famous Cooper log that one gets from gamma equals zero. And if we have a retarded interaction um, and a non fermi liquid state, this is the one minus gamma that we had been discussing for a while, then there could be, as I said earlier, a little bit of a trade-off between these two powers that after all, in the end of the day, um, give us scale invariant uh, behavior because they cancel one another here. So now this is an equation that followed from the Yukawa SYK model. Straightforward, one line after the other, you get that uh, you solve for the normal state, you linearize near the superconducting transition temperature, that's what you get. But of course, and that's the beauty here, this is for condensed matter physicists, nothing uh, particularly new. It is an equation that has been around for a number of years. Maybe some of them didn't write them down quite as explicitly as they could have. Um, but if you look at the instability towards superconductivity in a variety of compressible systems, such as ferromagnets and antiferromagnets with spin fluctuations, gauge field induced composite fermions, pneumatic fluctuations, so where you have different directions in the system entering the place or a number of other problems, we always find such a gap equation. The value of gamma then just differs and it typically spans a range from zero to one. In some cases it can be larger than one, but then you have to be a bit more careful. So um, careful what you do with this, in, with this uh, pole here. Um, uh, and, uh, but important is this is an equation that we know uh, where the normal state criticality and the anomalous appearing interaction trade off. Uh, Abanov and Chubukov have actually very recently analyzed this equation in greatest detail in a sequence of paper. And I use exponents gamma here all along, not what is usually used in the, in the holographic community because uh, that's in this form, 
uh, it has been given in this by this community the name gamma model for whatever creative reasons I, I don't understand. So this is the, 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 the linearized equation what we have and now we can um, play with this a little bit. And um, may, I, may I ask, interrupt absolutely. you? Absolutely, of course, please. So may, may I ask a question um, to relate this to what I know from the holographic side? So yes. um, maybe even one slide before this, leading to this equation. Um, so are you just saying that you're uh, looking for the linearized perturbations that are um, rendering the, the symmetric phase stable and then leading to a condensation? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I want to do. So, so um, here we have a, tr a superconducting transition temperature. This, this is numerics, right? These plots mm -hmm. that I'm showing you here is a result of numerics. Um, we have in all limits, found analytic expressions, you see indications for them, but in the end of the day, this is numerics. Um, uh, and, but so we do know we have the full nonlinear solution, but that's, I'm not even all that interested in this for, at least for this talk, but I, what I want to know, suppose I'm here at this parameter for the pair breaking at this temperature, then I know I'm close to the superconducting transition temperature. And therefore a linearized theory should tell us that the system becomes unstable. I mean, in the language mm -hmm. that is more appropriate would be that my that I'm, I mean, if I'm a T equal zero, I would be near the brighton loner friedman bound of that scalar field that is mm -hmm. behind there. But this we don't know yet uh, uh, in the condensed matter community. We are just linearizing the equation. And um, this looks like an eigenvalue equation and with, that has to have an eigenvalue one. That's the typical nomenclature that's been used in the community. So the linearized, Right at TC, I should be able to just solve for the linearized equation with infinitesimal um, values for the uh, anomalous fields that indicate condensation, just as you said. Yes, precisely. So you, you base, the holographic calculation would be calculating zero modes, that is modes at zero momentum. Um, Precisely, which which cross um, into the upper half plane frequency plane um, yes. at that value, rendering the system unstable. Okay, exactly, good. and mm -hmm. that's exactly what what is in your next equation. That's why there's only an uh, an energy density or like like an energy scale as opposed to length right. scales. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. So exactly. So what? I, so this is energy here because the model that I'm looking at is a zero dimensional one. It only knows energy. But it only has one variable. I think this might be uh, because uh, we are sitting in, in at some at some static limit of that problem, right? Um, yes, we, we, we will, this will be sharper in in just a second. But um, uh, I could formulate this at t equals zero. Um, the equations become a little bit ill-defined, so it's it's safer to to use temperatures and IR cutoff and then send it to to zero at the end of the calculation. Otherwise, there are a couple of uh, Headaches that uh, uh, plug, uh, that cause say unnecessary trouble, I believe. But um, what you can also do is, um, and I saw the trick for the first time in a paper with Dam Son and used it in a follow-up uh, paper with Chubukov and uh, have used it ever since. If you have such an equation, and if this exponent here is small, um, then this is a weakly uh, uh, smoothly varying function. So I can more or less split the integral when the running frequency is smaller or larger than the external frequency, and uh, then pull this out and just this, uh, this, this term is governed by whoever is larger. And if I do this little manipulation, it's straightforward steps, five lines, you can reformulate uh, this integral equation in terms of a differential equation. Uh, and, um, well, everybody, I mean, I at least like differential equation a lot more than integral equations, uh, primarily probably because uh, there is a Mathematica command D solve, but none for integral equation. But um, uh, clearly it is simpler this way. And uh, we looked at this equation and we had two inputs. A, there was, this is after all from an SYK model and everybody talks about um, holography there. And second, we had seen this, um, um, this uh, uh, BKT type essential singularity that was uh, already discussed in context of say ADS2. Uh, so therefore it was straight, it was obvious that um, it, 
a natural question would be to ask whether I can just rewrite this differential equation um, by introducing new coordinates and maybe a coefficient um, and, uh, and then uh, find an equation that you guys uh, know and love, uh, namely the, if you want so, the static equation of motion of Lang Gordon equation um, or in ADS2. Uh, and that's, of course, that is possible. Uh, and, um, is, uh, and it gives us, that's the first important information for me, it gives us uh, a clear interpretation of the holographic variable zeta here, namely as the inverse of the, Matsu, of the Matsubara frequency that governs the relative time, not the absolute time, but the relative time, because we have, after all, we have two time variables, but we are talking here at the moment about the relative time, the internal structure of the cooper pair shall be probed. So this, this is a way by which I can at least mathematically reproduce uh, behavior that is uh, the same as uh, what enters in the klein gordon equation. And of course, also quite satisfyingly, it is different values of the mass that govern different universality classes uh, of the field theory governed by the exponent gamma here. Um, so, uh, it is, uh, it, so it smelled right uh, that there should be a possibility to make a connection between the physics of the SYK model and holographic superconductivity in a say line by line and step by step way. Uh, and we, have, we had a hunch of how this mapping should look like at least in some limit, namely where the Celiashberg equation uh, is the right equation. So, um, but of course, if you really want to show this and for it makes sense uh, to try to do this mapping not on the level of some static equation of, uh, of motion, but on the act level of the action of the problem. So I remind you, among the many fields of the action were a number of bilocal fields, among others, also the Gorkov greens function, so the, or the object that on the saddle point becomes the Gorkov greens function, the enormous greens function. And as we will hop uh, back and forth between time and frequency, uh, just need to uh, set our brain in the, um, in the right direction. So we have two times. And if I do the Fourier transform, it's the relative time that epsilon as I've just been using, and the total time will be a frequency omega. So, I mean, I will try to use, say this again and again, but um, just so we are not getting too confused. And uh, I can now expand my SYK many body action in terms of uh, this, uh, this field. Um, uh, and uh, the steps are to some extent similar to what was done when you try to get uh, the effective kernel that gives you the scrambling rate, for example, uh, or the or the Schwartz in action uh, in the non-superconducting version of the SYK model. Here we're doing this for the superconducting sector. And as we are staying Gaussian, it just lives on its own right and it's governed by the normal state. We are just expanding in this scalar field here that had, depends on these two variables. Uh, and uh, we have here um, an object that is ultimately the particle-particle propagator. Uh, so governed by the single particle Green's function with its uh, branch cut behavior and so forth that we had seen earlier and we know from the normal state. And this is the boson that mediates this pairing, our phonon that has its own, I uh, already mentioned to you, it goes with the power gamma. This is the infrequency space, the boson propagator. So this is the action we have. Uh, and all we need to do now is to see whether we can find a dictionary that goes from this Gaussian action to another Gaussian action, namely that lives in entered sitter space and has a scalar field there. And, uh, uh, the first guess uh, that you might um, uh, try is to basically rephrase what we've just seen from the differential equation. There was a power law. I'm calling something Z here for reasons that will become clear, a holographic variable, and have the inverse frequency given this new variable. And then we have time. So do this for every time point. And uh, you have this same power law that we've just seen, just formulated now in terms of the function F and not phi, they are relationship at, the, at least at the linear level is well defined and understood. So if I do this, I get a, indeed a geometric interpretation of all of this. I can write this in a way um, that uh, with this mapping, my scalar field uh, action has uh, this form here. 
and I can introduce a metric. And in terms of this metric, I can write down an action. Uh, unfortunately, however, if you look at this, uh, this is not the enter the sitter action, but um, it looks, if anything, more like uh, like a um, like a dissiter action or like a um, uh, you, like a Lorentzian action, but uh, in a Euclidean space. So it is it's kind of the wrong geometry of the problem. Uh, and more, even more disturbing, if you take this literally here, this minus sign here really means. Uh, that um, there's an instability in the problem, right? I mean, the most favorable configuration should really be, uh, there should be a T here, not a tau. Uh, so T, however, still standing for the total Matsubara time. Uh, so this here should give me um, some instability for high frequency fluctuations of this field, something that must be somehow stabilized by boundary conditions. Anyway, so the first attempt fails, and uh, you can uh, assure I can assure you that we look very long uh, for this minus sign to become a plus sign in our analysis, and it never really was willing to do so. So what does help, however, is an insight that we learned uh, from the holographic community, who and I think ultimately it is goes under the name of the kinematic space. So. So the statement being that uh, if I have um, um, if I have uh, an if I look at an entered sitter space, um, then two geodesics in the entered sitter space are near if two points in the space that we've just been discussing are near, uh, and uh, that we really should think of this as the space of geodesics rather than as the space of say point objects in the holographic context. And how to deal with this problem was uh, well discussed and described to us and particularly in the second paper, um, uh, that you have to do a, a Radon transformation so that you integrate, um, for example, the enter the field over a geodesic that is parameterized by a center point and the radius uh, in this Poincaré coordinates. It's a half circle, as you know. So, so therefore, this ultimately, therefore, what we are looking here is at uh, a non-local map to some extent, uh, and the non-locality becomes particularly necessary as you mix, say, the holographic uh, variation and uh, the actual dynamics of the problem. It's something you wouldn't even notice on the level of a static theory, um, consistent with the statement that indeed this minus sign here would for a static theory never occur and you should be happily calling this the static ADS action. Um, so with this insight, we are finally at a point where we can make our connection explicit. So once again, my Gorkov propagator, uh, now I'm talking about total time and frequency of the relative times again, and this variable can now written as a power law uh, that we have been encountered a number of times and uh, a Radon transformed scalar field that lives by itself in enter the zeta space. So this is the explicit map that we identified um, between a field psi and um, a, um, a field that lives on in our field theory and ultimately still, never mind Radon transformation, this holographic variable still has to some extent, um, at least when there's not much dynamics going on, the meaning of an inverse uh, frequency in the problem. So, and if you do this, use this map, insert it, and uh, look at least uh, at low energies, because this is a gradient expansion here, we do get um, an action that is the action of a holographic superconductor in ADS2 with Euclidean signature. And this is where I gave the warning at the beginning. I believe a, a significant portion of this audience and of qualified holographers would all say, oh, of course, had to happen. It's trivial. And clearly, it is to some extent trivial, um, but um, in the same sense that um, I believe it was trivial that Gorkov had to get uh, the Gisborg Landau equations from the microscopic BCS theory. And it's still satisfying if you're actually doing it because now I understand what you guys have been doing all along, uh, at least, right? We can also become a bit more microscopic. We can understand where the individual terms in this action come from. And uh, we can understand, we can obtain, say, phase diagrams for systems where we know the Hamiltonian force. So give an example. Um, 
this radial um, uh, in, uh, term here that goes in the holographic direction has its root in the frequency dependence of the boson propagator. So the singular pairing interaction drives this, um, uh, this uh, gradient in the radial direction. This uh, temporal dynamic, the dynamics of the field comes, uh, and that's obvious because the only frequency dependence is actually here, from the excitation spectrum of particle particles in uh, this soup of, say, non quasiparticle particle uh, superconducting systems that are the virtue of being superconducting, right? So, um, and both terms in, uh, contribute to the mass. Both terms give a contribution to the mass. And both contributions are quite different. This first term here reflects the fact that um, bad quasiparticles, bad non quasiparticles don't want to pair. And it always gives a positive mass. And on its own right, it would never drive an instability towards superconducting state. Um, and it's only because of the singular pairing interaction that gives a negative contribution to the mass that there's even hope of getting this. This alone, this contribution here is always more negative than the brighton loner friedman bound. So if it wasn't for the pairing interaction hating pair, for the particle excitations, hate particle particle excitation hating superconductivity, this would always be superconducting. And it's a trade-off between these two terms that decides where we are. And uh, at t equals zero, the instability that we get from the Lerschberg equation is identical to, of course, what uh, is well known in the holographic community as the bright loner friedman bound, which for ADS2 is minus a quarter the units I'm using. So, so everything here comes together, we, and, uh, but also we have explicit microscopically determined expression for those masses, that, which at least for a solid state physicist is not something you should completely ignore. The, Approaches, however, not limited to this zero dimensional problem. I will now be much quicker, but only sketch the ideas. Uh, the model that we put forward was generalized uh, by the Berkeley group um, to Dirac systems. So what we're doing is we are looking at a d-dimensional d space or um, uh, um, dimensional Dirac system um, where we have um, now Dirac fermions coupled to some scalar bosons that have a mass. Uh, and on each, say, spacetime point of uh, this Dirac problem, uh, we have n additional fermion and m boson flavors. And we let n and m be big, have random couplings, and the ratio of n over m is fixed. Something that we also did for the other problems. We have different uh, numbers of flavors. It's not all that important uh, right now. So, and this problem can now be again solved in the large NM limit. Uh, and uh, you again get um, this uh, uh, coupled fermion and, and boson problems that have power law solutions. Depending on solutions, this happens, well, in D equals zero, it's the same what we've just had. Uh, but depending on which dimensions you look at, uh, you find um, sometimes critical solutions only at isolated points or at lines or in, in finite regions uh, and so forth. And the marginal dimension for the problem is three, three space dimension, uh, sp four space time dimensions. So we have now finite dimensional problems and the solutions here are wonderfully Lorentz invariant of this problem. Um, we looked at the superconducting instabilities. The superconducting instabilities are here in a finite angular momentum channel um, that, uh, say, freezes a certain amount of, of directional dependence of the problem. It's a longitudinal in the, in the, uh, the gamma matrix space and has a certain uh, angular momentum internally as a pair. Um, and uh, this may, at the moment, primarily be a, a technical point. The important point is that we can step by step repeat this holographic map and find that um, the anomalous propagator is now also a space and time dependent object. The angular di direction of the relative motions are getting frozen because there's only one angular momentum channel that actually matters. And therefore only its magnitude is really a variable that, that is dynamical and it's, it's still important. And it is this uh, dynamical uh, variable that ultimately 
sets, uh, determines the holographic variable modulus, the radon transformation that we have seen, and there are again power laws in the game as usual. So now the holographic variable is not the inverse frequency, um, but being Lorentz invariant, it is the inverse uh, spacetime um, uh, momentum of the problem. Uh, and that tells us how is we probing the internal structure of this problem, while the total center of gravity and, and center of uh, in time and space determine the usual um, space-time space dimension, not the additional dimension. So we have seen uh, that this problem now, for, for example, the two-dimensional to space dimension, a problem maps onto ADS4. Um, and uh, this being, of course, a Dirac system right at the neutrality point. Uh, another model is that you would take instead of a Dirac problem, the problem with a finite Fermi surface. And this was done here in a paper by Ilya Estelis, with whom I did the initial problem, uh, Guru Patel and, and Sabir Sachdev um, last year. They analyzed this problem and found numerically that uh, the self energy of this problem is weakly momentum dependent and has this well defined bosonic frequency dependent and momentum dependent. If I take this weak frequency dependent as exactly frequency independent, I can repeat all the steps we've just seen. And I find now something that uh, might not surprise you that we get a holographic interpretation, but it will be ADS2 cross R2 um, because the holographic information is really only in the time sector of the relative frequencies, not the spatial one. Uh, and that's, of course, something that uh, I think has been discussed in the context of holography, of course, that charged black holes ultimately enter uh, um, uh, um, a low energy description in ADS2 cross R2 or RD, um, whatever, uh, RD minus two, right? Um, well, you know what I mean. I'm just not capable of doing subtraction. So what we're seeing is depending on whether we have a neutral or a compressible system, these holographic description give us what uh, the holographic community, I think, would expect us to obtain. The last comment, and I'm almost done with this talk, is what happens when I add, this. oh yeah, finer temperatures. Uh, if you're going back to the SYK model, all of what I told you go, works at, at zero temperature, but can be expanded to finer temperatures. And if you exploit the fact that on the one hand, the SYK model uh, can you can relate finite temperature and zero temperature results by, by, by coordinate transformations. And equally so for an ADS2 metric, uh, you can use all these tricks, map it onto the zero temperature problem, use the mapping we've just said and map back. Uh, and if you do all of this, you find of course that now uh, the effective description is in terms of um, an ADS2 field at finite temperatures. That might not surprise you. Um, uh, if there was uh, a, a field, a so also an external electromagnetic field can be realized and um, its root is essentially any deviation of the filling of the SYK model from half filling. So the microscopic region of this an electrical field that enters the vector potential here is indeed the deviation of the carrier concentration of the SYK model from half filling, which in a large region is essentially just linear. And here there will be a first order transition to, to a, a state that is, uh, say, changes in character where you don't have the critical solution anymore. So near half filling, we do find that ultimately this holographic uh, language still survives, but we need to inform the system of the deviation of half filling by having a finite electrical field in the boundary. We can add source fields, uh, which could be realized by a Josephson junction. Let me take an arbitrary time dependent uh, source field coupling to my fermions in my, say, field theoretical description of the problem. I do my holographic map, I do my radon transformations, and so forth. And then I'm getting an effective uh, source field that acts in my ADS2. And now this might uh, surprise you a little bit because this source field really acts in the bulk. Um, but uh, you can either find a transformation that works uh, actually only at zero frequency, zero omega frequency, uh, that, um, that you can shift your field by the source term. Ultimately, therefore, the, the field that lives in the bulk is a combination of source and, um, uh, and VEV, uh, and that uh, 
probably is also for the holographic community very natural. Alternatively, you need to do some a somewhat more sophisticated multi-trace deformation in order to, to cope with this aspect of the problem. But uh, lo, uh, in the end of the day, you still find uh, what uh, seems to be very natural from the holographic perspective, namely that you can encode the information about a source field in appropriate boundary conditions after having done either multi-trace deformation or uh, or just a mere shift of variables. If you do this, of course, you can do something that I wasn't aware of so far. Namely, you can steal from the holographic community, for example, the information about the pairing susceptibility. Here, this is uh, from a 2015 paper uh, about the pairing susceptibility as it would follow from, from holography for ADS2, and then use this information but we have explicit microscopic expression for all parameters and then determine again the phase diagram or look at, for example, critical slowing down near the phase transition as it's classical. Look at the dynamical susceptibility here as it has a very funny behavior that's almost constant then diverges like one over log squared, I believe. Or look at the uh, particle hole asymmetries as you change the carrier concentration by changing this background electrical field. Bottom line is, um, we, I believe, have not just obtained a mapping for our own satisfaction understanding, but um, uh, at least for a person like me, it seems now more feasible to employ uh, the uh, worked out information and in the holographic community to apply it and to solve actual many body problems or address a problem such as non, non uh, equilibrium dynamics uh, or say, look at even uh, fluctuations beyond the Lerschberg limit. So I can conclude. Um, I told you before, there were two approaches to look at superconductivity via critical bosons uh, and holographic superconductivity to address pairing in critical systems. And at least through this toy model of analyzing the SYK model and uh, connection that we can do in both directions, I think we can with some confidence say that really these are the same descriptions. Um, these are not the same descriptions. These are different descriptions that describe the same phenomenon. And uh, finally, uh, I believe, and this may be something for the future, that having an explicit map, concrete calculations can be done. We can obtain and answer questions where holography should be the right perspective. In other words, where we have a critical normal state uh, and then address uh, problems such as phase diagrams, pairing mechanisms, and dynamic responses, and so forth. Having said that, I thank you very much for your attention uh, and uh, looking forward if you have some questions. Thank you so much, Jörg, for this inspiring talk. Thank you. Um, I have some questions, but I, I will give the stage to others since I already asked during the talk. Of course. And does anybody have questions? Well, maybe um, to, to give people some time, let me ask my question first. Um, also fulfilling my selfish needs. I will ask you about the um, pairing mechanism um, at vanishing charge. Um, at least in ADS4, um, it, was, it was shown that um, holographic superconductors uh, for an uncharged scalar operator um, display superconductive phases, uh, instabilities and um, superconducting phases. Um, I, in the Hartnell Horowitz um, yeah. Herzog paper, and uh, is there so maybe I just didn't see through your your formalism enough to understand like where would that fit in there? Mm -hmm. So so uh, remind me one more time. They said they do not find. I thought uh, they, they do find. So so they yeah. um, they consider in the second paper they find ah. um, uh, th that um, even uncharged scalar operators develop a condensate um, below a certain critical temperature or to yeah. to um, background charge ratio um, or whatever you want to call it, like the but chemical that, potential. Yeah. But that's wonderful. So, I mean, let's look at this Dirac problem, which is probably the most natural way to have an uncharged uh, uh, a problem. We are at perfect neutrality. The system 
uh, is in our calculation becoming a superconductor, a wonderful superconductor. Um, so the uh, uh, the and uh, it doesn't have a Fermi surface. Clearly, I mean um, uh, the the superconductivity is in this microscopic model really only possible once the coupling constant reaches a threshold. So now this, I mean, you, you cannot get for an arbitrarily small coupling constant uh, superconductivity here, but at least in the large n limit, I mean, we have permission to choose whatever value we wish. Uh, so the actual phase diagram of this problem is if you imagine some coupling constant, um, you have at zero coupling constant, you have good old fashioned free Dirac fermions. And you would crank up the coupling constant at some point, you will actually get a superconductor. This system isn't yet critical. So you, you already get superconductivity before the system even wants to be at a critical point. And, and if you crank up further, the normal state would be critical in the sense that it opens a gap. Um, uh, and, uh, and and uh, and that point TC is also largest, um, but uh, so you can perfectly well get uh, a superconductivity. You can also have a coupling constant that's too small and you don't get it. Uh, so, but but uh, it is possible uh, to have that. That's, that sounds like the opposite of what um, what the Cooperts do, where you have a pseudo gap opening before you have a coherence um, leading ah. to superconductivity. Yeah. Somehow, this seems to be like the inverted. Absolutely, because the Dirac, the, the, the corporates clearly are not uh, Dirac fermions where I crank up a coupling constant, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the corporates have, um, uh, have are, um, are born out of a mod insulating state. Uh, so in this mod insulating state, charge states are fully gapped. I mean, with a large, big, fat gap. And that system is just a plain insulator at t equal zero. Uh, and now you need to dope in carriers. Um, and whatever you do uh, will probably have to have a transition temperature that vanishes as you go towards that insulating state. So it's just a very, very different state. It also, in my view, and probably others see this differently, I don't understand quite what the criticality of the mod state really is, but it may well be, um, this could, there could be criticality in the sense of say some spin liquid state that's underlying it. And then a holographic perspective would be appropriate but we would have now a situation where really we need to have uh, um, realize an insulating state um, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, basically zero compressibility uh, um, out of which we are, the system is born by doping. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this is would by no means be the right uh, description for say, understanding the phase diagram of the cuprates. If you look at this Dirac system, the mat material here behind would be say a polar material with a phonon that breaks inversion symmetry that is at the verge of condensing and becoming a ferroelectric. And uh, before this ferroelectric state merges, emerges, this phonon is so strongly coupled that it can even make a Dirac system with no carrier superconducting. That, so it's a completely different solid state application for that problem. Mm, yeah, I'm asking also, uh, first of all, thanks for the, for the answer. Um, and uh, I, I like the direction of my question was um, the, the pairing mechanism because um, it seems like that. So in the in the holographic uh, system, uh, Hartnell, Herzog, and Horowitz argue that there's a different um, type of uh, like instability leading to to this um, uncharged co uh, condensation versus the charged constant condensation, and um, also. Like in the in, like that's why I was asking about the cuprates because like the the, un, the pairing mechanism is also not quite clear and so the, yeah yeah so yeah. just trying to to put things into relation mm -hmm. um, so I, before I dwell on this because this is like a definitely a, something that is dear to my heart but um, let let's see if anybody else has questions. Can I ask on when you are commenting because I'm getting confused. Uh, so when you say uncharged, this is something I was going to ask. The map that uh, Jörg uh, showed is a map to a complex scalar in ABS2 or to a real scalar? Hopefully to a complex. No? Complex scalar, of course. Okay. So then answer to, to Matthias' question, I mean, once you are in ABS2, the complex scalar, hopefully if the mass is above, below, below the BF bound, as he, I think he showed, 
is going to condense. Maybe the question is how you get ADS2 in the first place, which normally in holography, you need some charge density to get. Right? Because this is my other question. Right. In your first map, you didn't show any coupling to a gauge field on the holographic side. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what mm -hmm. I have is a super fluid, not really a superconductor. Right, so I well, have yeah. a problem. Yeah, I have a problem with a with a with a global U one, uh, not with a local U uh, one with fluctuating gauge fields. Uh, and uh, yes, that's precise. Uh, so therefore, uh, I have no. Uh, this is a superfluid period. Yeah, yeah, but even in holography, yeah. to call it a superfluid, we need the gauge field. Yeah, but um, the, bulk. <laughs> the, the point that I was making is, is coming from this paper um, by Hartnell Herzog and Hor Horowitz. So this is yeah, yeah. Um, that even even an uncharged operator can condense um, because you're you're of of the geometry. Yeah. So uh, in the bulk, uh, you need uh, um, a gauge field. That's correct. Um, but the, the gauge field here at the static limit of this problem has, uh, is only an electrical field that happens to vanish at neutrality uh, of this problem, but you can still have superconductivity in this case. Um, uh, but, uh, so you, uh, but the generic situation requires you to have a gauge field in the bulk, even if you didn't have one on the boundary. Correct. Yeah, so that's what follows here and that as you say, correct, must be the right prescription. To be honest, I read those sentences so many times and I asked, what are these guys talking about? I mean, in the sense of why is this happening? Not that there, I was doubting the correctness of the statement. And at least uh, this calculation makes very clear what, what is behind this to me. I find this very suspicious that everything is correct with the hologram. I mean, the, you know, coming from the other side, uh, I can identify over and over, we can identify over and over again things that you guys know very well. Uh, and uh, so to that extent, uh, we haven't gained anything. We haven't said anything interesting, uh, but it's still uh, say it's satisfying to see that this whole construct seems to be making sense and that you can make say direct contact to it. It's yeah. an imp important link, yeah. Um, I I guess Daniel and you were just telling telling me that there needs to be some sort of symmetry that needs to be um, spontaneously broken. Um, uh, I, I think that's what what you guys were trying um, trying to yeah, tell but, me. And yeah, if but this, if the scalar is complex, he is breaking the symmetry. Yeah, but yeah. But yeah. he it's, arrives it's, to a mass term that uh, normally in holography, this mass term is a mix of the gauge field and the mass of the scalar. Yeah. But I guess in his case, comes from the mapping and yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in the generic case, we also find the mass to be a combination of the gauge field and the scalar. Uh, but uh, adjusted neutrality, uh, that, that's not the case. Otherwise, it is there. Um, and the symmetry that's broken is a global U1, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have another question from, I believe that's Alex uh, Buchel uh, in the chat. I'll just read it to you, So, but you can also mm -hmm. read along. In this construction, how can any metric other than the finite T ADS2 emerge? Something as esoteric yet opportunistically used in the plenty uh, of ad hoc holographic works as Lipschitz hyperscaling violation, Bianchi um, 7, etc. So it's, the, the, I guess the first question is the, the, the first is the question. Mm -hmm. So I think in principle it can. So let's suppose I want to do the following problem. I go to my Dirac problem. That's at least, I mean, uh, when I talk about Lifshitz, I need to have at least some spatial coordinates, right? Uh, at least makes it more sense to me. Um, but I could, uh, well, yeah, let's, let's do it this way then. Uh, then I could have anomalous scaling because of precisely um, being at some fine-tuned uh, point where I have different gradients in different directions. I could see this. Um, and with Jan, we looked into a related problem earlier. Um, so how you get dynamical scaling exponents different from z equals one is maybe this is the question. I don't know what the question really is. Well, Lifshitz, you mean that you have that you have anomalous dimensions in certain directions, right? That could be time, could be space also, right? Um, and uh, 
It can only happen if, suppose my, I, I told you the dynamics is coming is inherited from the particle-particle excitation spectrum. And that gives us this had in our case, a regular expansion. Um, uh, if there was some non-analytic, yeah, I don't, um, so as of this SYK model, I don't know how this could happen. Maybe I could cook up a model in the, in, 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 in the uh, of anisotropic Dirac series, something that we had been looking with John earlier, maybe they could give us uh, Lifshitz type behavior, but it's it's a good question. I, I haven't actually honestly thought about it and I should have. Yeah, good question. I suppose a different way of saying, asking that is, is um, there's con there can be condensation near different types of horizons. Um, yeah. And, and so, yeah, how, how is, does that arise in this picture? Oh, it's, it's a wonderful question. I, I really like it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. Just I'm yeah. checking if I understood this. So maybe maybe um, we've, uh, we've uh, asked you long enough in the official part. So um, let's, let's thank um, Jörg uh, again for an inspiring talk and thank everyone for the discussion. I will... Um, Stop the recording here.